so we'll get going here. Um, so my name is Thomas Jackson, and we're, all believe. And we're from uh, LinkedIn, and we're here to talk about our old friend DNS. Uh, who here has used DNS? Okay, who, these guys with the hands not up, what is it that you guys use? Yeah. <laughs> ah, Google, thank you. Host files, thank you. There you go. <laughs> All right, so everyone's used DNS. Um, it's kind of, you know, fallen out of favor. I don't know. It, it's not talked about except for, you know, when people talk about DNS, like, and then we all laugh. Um, so before we get too much into that, let's talk a little bit about who we are, what we do. So we're both on the traffic SRE team at LinkedIn, and so the question that people ask is, what is traffic? What do we do? Um, so we're responsible for all the proxy infrastructure, all the pops around the world, um, and, and basically just fixing a bunch of stuff. Uh, we get involved with lots and lots of operational issues, mostly because we understand how most of the stack works. Um, I guess kind of the downside of running infrastructure. Um, but basically it boils down to we get the traffic from the end user to the correct front end in the correct data center as quickly as possible, as much as possible. Um, and then, the, you know, of course the question comes, look, what proxy do we use for all this stuff? We use Traffic Server, which you may or may not have heard of. It's a pretty cool piece of software, Apache project. It's cool. So, so what is this about service discovery? Um, why are we even talking about it? This is easy, right? Traffic is easy. That's what everybody tells me. Traffic is so easy. It's just getting packets to boxes. What's so hard about this? So, I mean, obviously there's hosts that are running the service. You just need to send some requests to it. Like, how hard can this be? Load balancing is easy. Routing is easy. I mean, it's so easy. Let's just do this. Why are you even talking? Um, so the, the, the question that kind of comes up with what, what is your environment that you're actually running in, right? In, a, you know, in the theoretical, academic sense, yeah, there's some boxes sitting here, but really that's not how the world is. Um, our platform is actually very multi-tenant. Like when we started out years ago, we just worked on the LinkedIn properties, but we've actually acquired some companies and LinkedIn's grown. So we actually support LinkedIn, SlideShare, Linda, and a bunch of other miscellaneous stuff. So we're a big multi-tenant system, so we can't just work specifically for one. Um, there's legacy everywhere. Who, who here operates stuff with legacy? Okay, all of your hands should be up. Everything, ha everybody has something legacy. And it's just, just the way life is, right? There's just stuff that we're never going to be able to upgrade because no one wants to touch it because there's dragons. Uh, and then, you know, especially with this move to lots of microservices, there's new ones all the time popping up and they're scaling up and they're scaling down. Oh, there, that's the next slide. Up and down. Stuff's changing all over creation. So there's this need for service discovery has really kind of taken off because, um, you know, back in the day with your 10 web servers or whatever uh, and scaling up, we, we kind of need this. Um, so then the question is, you know, isn't this problem already solved? I, I, I looked around on Hacker News or Google or whatever, and I found all sorts of so solutions to this. So there's some common solutions to this problem. There's frameworks like Restly or Thrift or something like that that, that kind of tackle this service discovery problem primarily for um, um, app to app uh, API communication. Uh, the, the good thing is they solve that problem. The, the kind of the, the, the cons here is they kind of solve two problems at once. They usually end up solving this request response, like how we serialize the request, in addition to how we find the box to talk to, uh, which solves a bit more than we want from the traffic perspective. What we really want is I have an HTTP proxy, and I need to talk HTTP to some front end, and I need to know which one to talk to, where, and when they want traffic. Um, so usually what people end up doing, what I've done at some previous companies, and I'm sure some of you here have done, is make some other service discovery mechanism, which is easier. So we all put the air quotes, it's easier. We made some little zookeeper thing, you run some little agent, everything works. Um, the, con, the, the big problem here is that it doesn't really scale to all the platforms. Like you just wrote this little script, you have to go make it for all the things, and there's glue all over creation, and you end up with more duct tape than anything else. Uh, and the common problem here for both of these is that it's kind of a high barrier to entry. Like you have to write something else, glue something else together, and so it doesn't really work well for open source stuff and especially legacy things, because no one is ever going to go touch the legacy things. So, um, Oh, yeah, and in a large-scale environment, of course, everything's multi-tenant, and so relying on a single source of truth for this single service discovery stuff doesn't, isn't, isn't really a possibility, right? So we rely, on, like at LinkedIn, we have lots of different sources of truths for the various different properties and within the properties for legacy things. So, of course, the answer is making another thing, right? And, you know, XKCD, that's for the, exactly this scenario. Because um, why do we need another thing? Because then we'll just make more. Um, but, so instead of talking about, you know, in the specifics here, we're going to try and talk about this a little bit, like how, how we pick the solution, right? Because I imagine you guys all do the same thing. We've got some problem. How do we solve it? So we'll use this as the example, right? So really, 
you know, it's, it's requirements-based engineering, right? We figure out what the requirements are, we find some solutions that might work, and well, we pick one, and then we do it. So when we wanted to, you know, with our requirements, we kind of had you have to, you know, a hard thing sometimes is splitting out what is what, what you need and what it is that you want, right? So for us, what we really need is we need a reliable service discovery mechanism. I just need to know what box to send requests to. Uh, and I also need to know whether a box wants traffic. So uh, relying just on TCP connectivity doesn't work in the case where a box is out of rotation, right? It might be up, but it might be broken for some reason. We don't want to send it traffic. So some sort of concept of whether the box wants requests. And all the rest of it is just stuff that we'd really like. We'd really like one thing to talk to. It's not ideal to have multiple, but we could deal with it. Um, we'd like to be able to debug whatever this thing is. Um, and you know, of course, since we're all lazy, uh, major bonus points if I don't have to do anything. Um, you know, that hopefully everyone else is just as lazy and it's not just me. Um, so when we're looking for these solutions, there's lots of sources of truth. We have like internal topology services, Restly has its own thing, Thrift has its own thing as well, Range, uh, which is a Yahoo-ism which no one uses except us. Um, you know, there's all these different places to look and so like internally we use this Restly thing to do it um, but as I mentioned before it kind of solves the two problems of you know request response and dis uh, service discovery and neither it didn't really map well and so we kind of picked to using this DNS stuff directly in traffic server um, traffic server since it's an HTTP proxy already knows how to talk DNS and cache DNS and do that asynchronously and so we figured we'd do use that as the uh, um, communication layer I guess um, so that's what we picked. DNS is really the original, I have a name, I need some place to go solution. And uh, so obviously it must have worked out well because we're here to talk about it, right? And there's people here, so that's good. Um, and, and one cool thing which people may or may not know, I realize a lot of people don't really keep up with the, the cool hip DNS things, um, which is, feels like an oxymoron. Um, so has anyone here heard about SRV records? Okay, cool. And is, who, here, who here uses SRV records? Okay, cool. So that's, that's pretty good. Okay, well, then maybe this slide is boring to you. But SRV records are pretty cool because what you can do is in addition to getting just back the IPs that go with hosts, you can include other information like the ports, uh, weights, priorities, and all sorts of stuff. So you as the client only need to know how, what protocol you want to talk to that service on and it'll tell you everything else about it, which actually ends up making your uh, infrastructure a lot less complicated because no one needs to know what ports everything is on, which is a pretty big problem, especially with the scaling up, scaling down, and multi-tenant platforms all over. So, so now that we've got the solution, we want to do this DNS discovery thing, like well, how do we architect this solution, right? And kind of similar thing, we're going to talk about, I'll talk, I'll talk about how, how we architected it in addition to, how we architect in addition to how this was architected. So really the, the iteration cycle process, I guess, for architecting is like setting some runtime priorities. Um, I, I, I creating what I call a service contract um, and then basically just iterating, right? While the requirements are not met, make a new thing, figure out how that doesn't work, and if you find something that doesn't work, do it again. And just keep going until you finish or give up. Um, and then once you're done, document it because you'll forget what you, what you did. So, um, so first thing when I talk about these runtime priorities, I'll, I'll make up some terms here. There's lots of different things for this, like, you know, uh, the RAS stuff from IBM back in the day, or you know, talk about cap there, or acid, or whatever you want to talk about. But basically, there's different things that you need to pick, right? There's trade offs for all services. You can't make the perfect service that's always available, and always accurate, and always fast, and always everything. You got to pick some things. What's your priority? So, for here, I'll talk about, you know, for, for this particular slide, we'll talk about, you know, availability, like will it respond? Consistency, will all the boxes respond with the same thing? And then an accuracy which is, does the box respond with what the actual answer is? Uh, which may change over time, right? So for this particular problem that we're solving, we care most, for, most about availability. Uh, I have to be able to send requests to front ends. If I cannot, then everything is down and people are upset and screaming and yelling and I'll have to get woken up in the night and I don't like that, I like sleeping. Um, next thing, we want all the boxes to return consistently, right? If we want to get the same answer so that everybody gets routed in the same place and then, you know, ideally we're actually correct with source of truth. Um, although these are, you know, that's the last one, we actually care about all of these, but that's, that's the order we picked for this. So 
So with that, the service contract is kind of like when you read RFCs at the beginning, it kind of just defines you know, what it is that this service does. TCP is you know, a guaranteed delivery protocol, you know, that sort of thing. So for us, this is an eventually consistent uh, data set across the cluster, best effort consistency to the data source, best effort status of the hosts, uh, an IP resolution, and then we have some, some responsibilities that go on the client. We don't solve everyone's problems, right? Uh, we're just DNS, so we rely on the client to do the failover correctly as the DNS RFC specifies, and for them to do whatever load balancing they're gonna do across those IPs. Um, so the architecture kind of goes like this. So we started out like we have a source of truth, and we wanna put some resolver thing in front of it, right? And so the, the, kinda, the questions to ask really are like, um, you know, how will it fail, how will it scale, and how can we extend it? So with the first box, right, like how will it fail, um, right now, if the downstream dies, or the source of truth dies with just a regular DNS resolver proxy effectively, you're screwed because you don't know anything and that guy's dead so you can't do anything. So the first thing we have to add is some sort of in-memory cache, right? So then this way, when the downstream goes dead, we still have the last known state. Um, the next thing is, you know, there's only one server here, so if we're gonna have more than one resolver, we need to have some sort of consistency between these guys because we want them to return the same result. And if only one of the resolvers ever got the query and then the downstream goes down, we wanna make sure that the other boxes know the answer. So we add some sort of gossip protocol between these guys so they can actually coordinate amongst themselves to figure out who's got the most up-to-date data and make sure that, it, that the, the cluster figures it out over time. So then the next problem we run into is, you know, you know, as we're thinking through this, is what happens when I restart a box, right? Since this is an all memory cache, as soon as it starts up, as soon as it gets requests, it's gonna start hammering the downstream, trying to ask for all these things that it knows nothing about. Um, similarly, if the source of truth is down when it restarts, it's not even gonna get those answers. So we wanna add some, you know, eventual persistence to disk, right? So we're just starting to add more and more boxes here. And so at this point, right, we're pretty comfortable with the failure modes here. Right? It pretty much covers everything, downstream's dying, you know, we have more than one box, they're consistent. And so we look at like, you know, how they're gonna scale, uh, or, or, and that looks pretty good too. We got multiple boxes, they're gossiping across each other, so we're, we're good. And then we think about how we're gonna extend it. So what, what happens when we get more than one source of truth? Because in reality, there's bunches of them, there's like tens of them. Um, and so really we need to make this pluggable. So we have some sort of plugin system right here so that we know, uh, we have a nice interfacing layer for you to talk back to your downstreams to figure out who you're trying to talk to. Um, and then after that, we still haven't answered the question of how do I know when a service is available? And so for these sorts of things, you know, some services actually have this built in. So for like Thrift or Restly or those sorts of things, the, the protocol itself actually knows. So Restly, for example, uses Zookeeper to keep track of which nodes are available. So you can actually ask. But some of the legacy stuff, like I'm sure everyone's got some box sitting there that you just send it a health check. And if it passes the health check, you send it traffic, right? And so all that means is that's how you know when that box wants traffic. So we want to you know, expose some of that functionality in our thing. So we basically added this distributed health checking mechanism. So you can ask the, the DNS discovery service, I need, you know, these are the, the 20 boxes that are mine. Please health check these guys and keep track of which ones are available. So this way for services that don't actually keep track of which hosts are available, we can do that for them. Um, so at that point, we, we, that's pretty much the architecture. That's exactly how it works with more details. But, uh, so I'm sure you guys have some questions and I will answer some of them hopefully right now so that you can you know, not be angry with me for the rest of the presentation about not answering your question. So first thing, the, the most common questions we get for this is like one, why doesn't the source of truth just handle all the lookups? Um, it, you know, in our world, it, it's a couple of things that kind of make this problem. <coughs> um, we have lots of different things that need to talk to all these sources of truth. And so it kind of becomes a, uh, an exponential growth problem. There's you know, N clients and M sources of truth and trying to keep all of them talking to each other is very difficult. And in addition, even if we could solve that problem, we don't necessarily want the source of truth to be able to handle the kind of load that we're throwing at it with the availability requirements that we have because the source of truth is a lot more focused around um, accuracy like be, having the correct data and being right than necessarily being available. Not that they're down all the time, but that's kind of the, the trade-off there. Um, then the second question is why, we, but we can make everything use X, you know, Thrift, Restly, whatever your thing is. Um, why don't we do that? Well, it's like that works, but then we're, once we go back to talking about the legacy and the multi-tenant stuff, it's pretty hard to actually get everybody to use something. Um, and then the third one is like, what about availability? And this is the same answer that you use for a lot of resolvers. If you have a single IP that you want to make available, you can just BGP it up. There's a question. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the question is, uh, do we rely on DNS discovery f for updating all the, the services, right? Dynamic, dynamic updates. Dynamic updates. Yeah, and yes, the, yeah. So what we do is it's actually um, attached, basically you, you attach a zone to a specific plugin, and then the plugin is responsible for resolving what hosts go to that zone. And so we, and it returns with whatever the TTLs, you can define them in your plugin as well. And we rely on those updates right through. Other way around. So the service boots and says, I'm foo, in the context of the DNS server, and adds itself to the, to that your dynamic DNS. It's actually the opposite direction. But, but yes, yes. So if you make a new service that shows up in the new, in whichever uh, topology service, it'll show up in DNS discovery. No human interaction required. Um, so no, I mean, at this point, we've architected the whole thing and we actually have to build the thing. So I'll, I'll let Ralph here talk about some of the implementation stuff. So the, uh, let me talk about the implementation. The first question people usually ask is, why SRE building that anyway? Um, it's, uh, the, the answer is it's a key piece of our infrastructure and we actually need that as traffic SREs and um, this is kind of thing we would rely on and, and use and um, the most important thing is the infrastructure should be written by people who would support that and to kind of pick up the phone late nights and because we can SRE E stands for engineers, and we're all engineers, I guess. So um, we try to make it in Python because it's a very simple language to use to prototype things. But we ran into some serious um, scale issues, even in staging environment, which is not very big. And we were able to do uh, 800, roughly 800 health checks per host uh, per um, service. So that wasn't very good because we had much more in production and that was because of Jill. And we could try to solve that using Python but it would create so much complexity we tried to avoid. So we just uh, tried to use it on Golang because it's cool and it was, the language itself was designed to handle concurrency and to uh, kind of be lightweight. And it was pretty fast. It took about a day for us to implement the first version in Go because we had uh, everything written down in Python. So we just like, kind of translated everything from Python to Go with some uh, small changes uh, because of the nature of Go lang itself. And sorry, and it was uh, the the result was very light and fast and. Uh, very easy to deploy. You, it's kind of a compiled language. You get the binary, you just put it on the servers and you start it and you're done. You don't have to deal with the dependency or any additional kind of um, things. It's just pretty easy. And we let it bake in our staging environment and um, uh, to test functions and see all the failure scenarios and see how it scales. And uh, the good thing is DNS is very easy to test. It's a simple protocol. We don't use something like DNSSEC or whatever, so it was easiest, easiest thing. And concurrency and the race conditions, Go has the built-in mechanism to test almost everything, so it's, it's pretty well instrumented. And the good thing, we weren't even the first users at LinkedIn. So we were in process of creating that thing and testing it, and we found out that people started using it right away once they knew about it, that that thing existed because it was very simple. They just naturally started asking questions and started using it. And we were actually the first users in production who started using that because we were continue working on, on, on the thing. Um, we had some problems, some rough edges uh, while baking. Uh, we brought staging down a couple of times, yes, but usually it's uh, because of the concurrency and deadlocks. What we found, have found is the channels are blocking, even the, the buffer channels. Eventually you run out of the buffer and it blocks. And um, mutexes, yes, the weird thing is you can't recursively acquire locks in GoRoutines. So you have to do with that. It feels natural that you can just like acquire read log multiple times, but you cannot. 
this is how it is. But yeah, rather than that, everything went smooth and good. And making it production to production, so Go has uh, multiple ways of uh, instrumenting things, and uh, we added metrics to everything. Like every single piece should have your metric because this is how you measure performance and the health of the of the service. So we added uh, the number of guillotines, we me measure the CPU usage, memory usage, number of uh, gossip messages, gossip queues, pacemaker delay, this is the important thing. You deal with the concurrency, so you need to understand how the, the queuing inside the, your service works, how good or bad. So basically we have a small uh, recurrent running uh, Go routine, which measures the delay between the time it's supposed to run and the time it actually ran. And it provides you the huge insight on how your service is doing. Because you can see that it's getting slower or getting faster, and you can react appropriately. And we uh, added a bunch of metrics to the plugins themselves just to measure how plugin works, because uh, we didn't create all the plugins. People started jumping into the code and creating the plugins for their own sor uh, source of truth and their own stuff. So it was kind of essential to, to, to have all of that. And of course, we had to add a bunch of customer um, focus metrics just to let people insights on how the servers perceived by us. Because we, like, we, we send the traffic to them and we need to show them if they complain about something not working, we have to show them, like, okay, guys, see, this service, your service, is not doing well. And here's the graph, and here's the alert for that. And yes, alerts. So we have so many metrics. It's easy to add any alerts you want. You just add them as you go. You start with some basic stuff, like memory usage, CPU, and then you go forward further and further to add more and more alerts until you kind of can sleep at night without worrying about the, something not working and you not knowing about that. So outcomes. We were able to significantly reduce the complexity of our um, service discovery and went from some kind of um, manual configuration to something dynamic. And we're currently having uh, like around 2,000 unique DNS service names so that's a significant improvement. We just don't have to do with that. It happens automatically. So people just add and remove their services, and we, we don't care. We just send the traffic. It's dramatically decreased the conversions time. Before, it was like one plus day for us to kind of configure a new service and multiple interaction and going back and forth with the service owners. Right now, it takes approximately three seconds to get the new service added and started getting the traffic. Ubiquitous service discovery, it's, it's easy. You can just curl your service using the name and you're done. So, and you can just use the health check or anything and it just works. Curl does the load balancing by, by itself, so it just, just runs and works. So people can debug their services and how, understand how we perceive them using that. And that's why gain so much popularity within LinkedIn because it's, it's easy, just natural. Uh, we were able to leverage the current DNS infrastructure. So currently we're getting about like 100, 800 QPS to the service, total combined. But if we look at the, the total QPS we actually generate from our traffic tiers, it's about 25,000. And it gets kind of funneled through the current DNS infrastructure. Across, the, across LinkedIn, so good. And we, the, the self-supporting community has grown, so right now we, we don't even kind of answer to the questions people ask, so we have a channel where people can hop in and ask questions, and we have the community around it, and we did almost nothing to, to actually create that community, so people just use it because it's easy. And as a result, is. Great success. Yeah, we're, we're happy and we're getting more and more people on board and this is why we're here to share our experience with you and see. Yeah, so 
Questions? Hi, I have a question about the load balancing uh, part. So you basically, if I understand correctly, you leave the load balancing automatically to whatever client that gets the DNS records. Uh, did you have any problems like people trying to exploit this to like, I, I disregard the best practices I sent uh, traffic to the same thing uh, as long as I can and see if I can try to bring it down or things like this. So, no, a, a little bit. Um, the primary user for the, the vast volume of traffic is actually us. So we own all the proxy tiers that are doing most load balancing. But yeah, so right now, like uh, we have a couple different uh, internal users that are using us, and yes, we rely on them to do the load balancing. But it's a pretty clear. Uh, the big thing that we did is like as part of that service contract is like what is the client's responsibility, and that's worked out pretty well because there's been a couple little complaints about that, and it's just pretty easy. It's like it's not us. We just give you the answer. You do what you want with it. Um, and this is actually actually being used internally to get rid of some of the some of the uh, older systems use VIPs for some internal communication, and they're actually just replacing that with those with this, which is nice. Okay. Hopefully, I answer the question. Two short ones. Um, is it open source, and what are the main differences to console? Um, okay. So, first question. Soon. We ran out of time before the conference. The goal is to have it done here, but it'll be done soon. Um, second question, you know, why is it different than console? Um, it's uh, unlike console or, or all of these other ones that I talked about, REST, uh, Restly, Thrift, all those things, um, DNS discovery is specifically meant as a unified uh, interface to talk to. It actually doesn't, it's not a source of truth for anything. So console specifically would be one of the back ends to this potentially. Right, so all this, what this lets you do is wire up one infrastructure through your DNS system that can talk to all your different downstreams. Uh, console, uh, Kubernetes, and a couple of those other things have done something similar, where they expose a DNS interface into their world. Um, with this one, we just allow you to wire up as many of them as you want through this, you know, eventually consistent, distributed, persisted, eventually persisted uh, cache system. That's a mouthful. Got to come up with a better word for that. <laughs> Traffic jam in the corridor. Uh, we should have had routing load balancing, sorry. Um, so what are you approaching for secrets discovery for the services that you may be advertising through the DNS service discovery? Uh, secrets discovery? Right, if uh, say a database credential or a, uh, or, or a certificate that is needed to talk to a service. Gotcha. We don't do any of that. We just tell you where they are. We don't know how you're going to talk to them. So in this case, we're the, the TLS and those sorts of things. Um, some of the, our services actually require client certificates and those sorts of things. Um, we just tell you what the hosts are. We don't know whether you're allowed to talk to them or not. That, that's kind of the contract we've got. All right, sounds like that's it. Well, we'll be hanging around here slash outside breaks next, so if you have questions, feel free to ask. <laughs>